Hi, everyone. Uh, we'll be getting started in just a couple minutes. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, in the meantime, feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat box and let us know where you're joining from. Okay, well, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for today's webinar. And uh, we'll be uh, getting started now, uh, since my, my clock says 2 o'clock. Um, so we are really excited for today's webinar, Caring for Children and Youth in Crisis, How to Create Healing-Centered Environments in After School. Uh, to make sure everyone can uh, engage with your comments, please make sure that you're speaking to panelists and all attendees uh, in your chat box settings. And for a better view over the course of the webinar, uh, you can go to your video settings and check the box that says hide non-video participants uh, under meetings. Um, so my name is Dan Gilbert and I am a senior program manager here with the Alliance. I'm really excited um, for today's webinar. Um, we are hosting, uh, today is the second in a three-part webinar series that the After School Alliance is hosting in partnership with the Forum for Youth Investment and American Institutes for Research as a part of their Readiness Projects initiative. Um, we do want to take a quick moment to check with the audience to see how many of you uh, may have joined the first webinar in the series. Um, so please take the poll question that just popped up on your screen now. And in the meantime, if you weren't able to view the first webinar in the series, I'm going to plug uh, links to both a recording of the first webinar, uh, which is here, and uh, to a two-pager that we developed that covers the high-level takeaways. So there's the first webinar recording, and this So those are two documents that can help catch you up um, after the fact, after today's webinar, if you'd like. Okay, um, uh, Chandler, you can wrap up our poll. And uh, so we are really, really excited. Um, so uh, to provide some quick context, um, when we were planning out the series, we knew it was important to reflect that we're in uniquely challenging times um, between the widespread social and economic fallout of the pandemic and the social unrest around the country following the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, we're really seeing the effects that all of these kind of different challenges are having on kids. And so in this series, our goal is lifting up the why and the how of implementing trauma-informed approaches and youth development programs, and also in helping provide some understanding of how after school and youth development programs can provide spaces for youth that are conducive to healing, uh, which is so critical right now. We also wanna be very clear that we're very deliberate in choosing the title of this series. Um, we believe that it's a critical time to take an asset-based approach to the challenges facing our youth. And so uh, here we just wanted to lay, in, lay out, when we say caring for children and youth in crisis, um, the definition of crisis reflects the, the situation we find ourselves in. It's a turning point for better or worse. It's a decisive moment. And so we're taking this not to reflect kind of the enormity of the challenges that we face, but also the opportunities that we have in this moment to move forward and improve the odds for all our kids. So um, the three webinars in the series build on one another. On Thursday, October 1st, um, I provided the links. Um, we hosted the first webinar in the series, which was focused on kind of what the research says, the why and how of implementing trauma-informed approaches and after-school programs. And uh, it provided an overview of what we know about the effects of adversity on child and adolescent brain development with an eye towards why trauma-informed practices and developmental relationships in particular are so important. 
And uh, just in, in just a couple of weeks, we'll be hosting the third webinar in the series, which is going to focus on how to advocate for, develop, and implement policies that support trauma-informed care and communities. Um, so we're really, really excited about the slate of speakers that we have uh, lined up for you today. Um, so our presenters and panelists for today's webinar are Sean Ginwright, um, founder and CEO of Flourish Agenda, uh, Salma Villarreal, who is a program community and engagement coordinator at Our Bridge for Kids, and Ebony Grace, the chief operating officer for uh, NJSAC, the statewide uh, after-school network for New Jersey. And then uh, the panel discussion in the Q&A portion will of the webinar will also be moderated by um, the magnificent Deb Maroney, uh, Managing Director at American Institutes for Research. And then uh, lastly, before I just kick it off to our team for, for all of their presentations, I really don't want to take too much time. So we're going to be um, starting off with some introdu introductory presentations by the panelists that will provide some quick context on the expertise and backgrounds that they kind of bring to these conversations. Um, after those quick uh, introductory presentations, Deb is going to lead our panelists in a nice panel discussion on how best to infuse after-school programs and systems with practices that both, re both reflect what we know about trauma-informed approaches and also that create the ideal conditions for healing uh, in, in these programs. And so lastly, uh, we did make sure to program in some time for Q&A with you, the audience. Um, so if you want to save your questions for then, uh, we'll make sure that we have uh, 10, 15 minutes to, to take questions from you all. And so with that, I am going to pass the proverbial microphone off to Deb. Thanks, Dan. That's the magnificent Deb. I like I like that new title. <laughs> I'll take it. Uh, no, we, we clearly have a magnificent panel today, and I, I'm so happy to be here with all of you. Before we get started, I actually wondered if we could see the results of that poll, or is, are the data top secret? Chandler? All right. Thank you. So just a little bit more than half of the participants did attend the first uh, webinar, and just a little bit under did not. And I will say, in all honesty, that um, I was really excited about the first webinar, but I also couldn't make it in person. I listened to it on my walk the other day. Um, it's you know really easy, easy listening, but I, I did want to hear the uh, feedback on how many folks had participated because that information, that body of evidence and research colleagues presented um, now a, a few weeks ago is really foundational to what the practice leaders uh, and researchers here are going to discuss. And so I'm going to total, do it a total injustice, but summarize quickly that the presenters uh, shared the consensus science findings, so the science of learning and development, that all young people have potential to thrive, which is not news to all of you who have been in the youth development field for, for your entire career. And that relationships can be reparative of, of the traumas and challenges that, that folks face. And not just relationships, but identity safe contexts and settings. And so one of the things I heard on that, on that webinar were a lot of questions of like, how do we do that work? I mean, that sounds right, that feels right, that feels familiar. And so our great panelists today are gonna uh, talk a little bit about how we do that work, how they've done that work uh, with families, with communities, um, and with staff, which is critically important as well. So we're gonna start off, as Dan said, where each presenter is gonna just take a few minutes to talk about their body of work, and then we'll go into some big juicy questions. Feel free to drop in the chat box. We'll be monitoring those and we'll be able to get to your questions hopefully at the end. And if not, if we don't get to your question at the end, we will be creating sort of a frequently asked question or a little brief at the end of this to share out with all of you. Similarly, uh, our good colleagues who have been coordinating these events are going to be putting resources in the chat box throughout. You do not have to take screenshots. We will also send those out to you after. But if you want to, you know, do a quick link, you could do that as well. So with I'm going to pass the baton, as Dan says, to Sean to kick us off to talk about his work on healing-centered engagement. Thanks, Deb, and thanks, Dan. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, I was glad, I'm glad to be here. I uh, just want to give you a quick sort of overview of, of my work um, and then really sort of how I sort of landed on this, this idea around healing and healing-centered engagement. I'm a long-term a youth development professional. I um, worked with the African-American youth for a number of years here in the San Francisco Bay Area. I'm also a researcher um, who uh, has researched um, really the relationship between the context that young people grow up in 
um, and the ways that youth, the youth organizations and uh, community-based organizations support young people. Uh, and so um, in doing healing-centered work, it was actually started and began with my own sort of training as youth development professional and someone who's trained in trauma-informed care was challenged by a group of African American young people, young uh, a group of African American young men, about five or six years ago, um, when we were talking about their experiences of trauma, violence, sexual abuse, um, homelessness, um, and I was abruptly stopped by one young man, and and he said to me. Uh, why do we always have to talk about the worst thing that ever happened to us? And I don't want to defi define myself by the worst thing that ever happened to me. Uh, and I think it was that moment that I began to really rethink and try to understand uh, a more asset-based approach uh, to supporting the health, well-being, and healing of young men and women who've experienced trauma. And so it was with that that I began to try to understand both the context that the, uh, the context um, by which trauma occurs, but then how organizations can respond in more holistic, uh, more asset-driven ways to support the restoration of well-being for, uh, for young people. Um, and so that body of work uh, really sort of um, was developed around healing-centered engagement, which I am happy to share with you today. Thank you, Sean, and it's hard not to respond to, to each of you, but we'll, we'll keep us moving on the, on the presentations and then get into a uh, conversation. Salma? Hi, everyone. Um, I'm very honored to be here today. I think oftentimes when I talk about trauma-informed care, I'm always talking about the ins and outs of it. I'm advocating the community for it, so it's like the science of it. And so I'm really excited to be able to share um, about the story of why and how we do it. Um, a little bit of context, Arbridge is a nonprofit that supports the education, acculturation, and resilience of newly arrived immigrant and refugee children and their families. Um, we really focused when we first started on academics and acculturation of our students. We helped with homework, reading, we made sure our students felt pride in their background and history. And really since the beginning of our program, we, you know, we just worked to uphold our values in working with children of love, respect, and diversity. And we created a center where love was normalized. We showed compassion to our students. We showed love. We believe that we should earn children's respects. And we knew that our students had really diverse life experiences, oftentimes traumatic ones, like life in refugee camps, migrating by themselves, and so many others that you encounter when you work with students who are recently arrived to the country. But we oftentimes just really took it, we had that mindset where, you know, children are really resilient and they're strong. And we had, we even told our children all the time, you guys are so strong after everything you've been through, here you are. And that's all stuff that is true, right? Our students are strong and inherently resilient. However, now we realize how dangerous that mindset is. And we realize that that mindset actually led us to believe that when a child is displaying challenging behaviors, there's something wrong with that kid. And there is something that, or something that is currently happening. And as time has progressed and our program grew from 50 kids to 150 kids, challenging behaviors like fighting, screaming, leaving the class, and so much more became really normalized in our center. And we had all these incredibly challenging situations every single day and 150 kids that we loved and no idea what to do about it, like absolutely none. And when these challenging behaviors did arise, we handled them in ways that did not really align with our values. Because when you don't really understand children's brains or the development of children and you can say you choose empathy and understanding all day long but when you really don't understand why this is happening your response is very a very natural response to what we've been conditioned to do it's oftentimes harmful to students really punitive actions that we take against students when they make mistakes and things that have been normalized in schools like suspensions and loss of outside times and like i said earlier things that did not align with our values as an organization and I remember when I started as a tutor in this program, I was exhausted every single day. I had a class of 30 kids, challenging behaviors every single day. And I remember really believing this work to be impossible. And I went to my dad one day, and my dad, everyone knows him as a teddy bear. And I told him about a situation where a kid had thrown a chair at me. 
and how I didn't know how to handle the situation because I've tried everything from contacting parents to contacting the schools to suspension to literally everything. And my dad told me to just go the next day and tell that kid that I forgive him and I love him. And I was like, okay. And my dad was like, and tell him all the great things that you know about him. And I was like, okay. And I rolled my eyes so hard because it's like, of course my students know that I love them and that I care about them. But I was like, what can I do but try? So I went the next day and I told the student, I said, you really hurt me when you threw that chair at me, but I forgive you. And I know that you did it because you were hurt. And I'm sorry that I made you feel that way. And I still love you because you are strong and you are funny and you are a leader and you make me laugh. And bit by bit, I start to see changes in the students. And so I started doing it every single day with all of my other students. And when I tell you that there was a transformation within my classroom, and every single day, you know, I had more and more students start to do their homework, start to apologize to each other, start to say I love you to each other. I stopped punishing students and I asked what they thought the expectations for our classroom should be and what the consequences should be. I started giving them more autonomy back in their classroom and teachers at school were telling me their students were behaving in the classroom more. And so we learned that love and compassion and community really does work in transforming students. We learned that some of our children were not healed from the experiences that they've encountered migrating to this country or before in their home countries or even here as a result of poverty and ICE persecution. And we learned that students have the natural inclination towards healing and love, and it is our job to guide them towards that healing and that process of learning to love themselves and others. And we learned that it was possible to transform students' lives. In that fall, I met Claire Conan, who is a PhD candidate specialized in trauma-informed care. I asked her to help me gain a deeper understanding of trauma and the impacts of it on children's brain and their development and some ways that I can create a classroom to nurture the healing of our students. So every single week, Claire came in, she sat in my classroom, we met once a week, and we discussed how to implement practices and better understand the way I work with my students. And I was able to truly learn how children with trauma learn and their response to controlling and harsh environments. I learned about the ways we have, as adults have been conditioned to punish children for their unconscious reaction to unfair things that have been done to them by governments or adults or systems of oppression. I learned how deep-seated the mindset of a few rotten apples was. I started to notice more and more the way that we spoke about children in ways that built resentment towards them, and I began to slowly change all of those things. I painted the wall of my classrooms to calming colors. I bought sensory toys for when children were having rough moments. I began practicing emotional regulation skills with them and coping skills. Claire taught me skills like tracking, paraphrasing, and choice giving, and bit by bit. Oh, and I also started one thing that was really important, working with parents so that they're actually doing those things at home with the student as well, and it wasn't just in my classroom. And we started to see that the change that I had last year with my students didn't even compare to the change that we had seen this year with my students. And UNCC actually did a, a case study on the classroom and, and tracked the social emotional development of our students. And they found incredible ways in which our students had grown. And I think when you're in the middle of this work, you don't really realize how much students have grown. And then you look back one day and you realize, oh my God, this student has not kicked somebody in five months. And it feels so good to realize that. But when you're in the middle of it, you don't realize it. Or you're like, wow, I haven't had a fight in my classroom in over a year. And so I think um, all of those things we started to really get to see in the case study, and it really showed that when students have proper support, community, and honest-to-God love, tremendous amounts of growth happen. So we, um, once I was done being a tutor, we started working with Claire to really implement those practices in our whole center, as, as well as raise awareness in our community for it. Our, I mean, Charlotte, North Carolina is a huge city for um, newly arrived immigrant and refugees. And so we started working first by looking at our programming and finding ways in which we were responsible for traumatizing students and for toxic stress in their lives, like yelling, overly punitive practices, racial bias, cultural insensitivity, the infantilization of our students and their families, and the oh so familiar need to control students, and so, so many more. I could talk for days about the ways that we found normalized school practices within our organization that harm students. And we realized before anything, we really needed to check our program and work to dismantle these things before we could have a truly healing-centered environment. And we moved on to educating our staff on the real implications of trauma. We spent many PD sessions learning about children's development, their brains, behavior, and so much more. We worked hard to transform our staff's mindset, which to me personally is the most important piece because in order to truly nurture an environment where children can grow and heal from things, 
they, the adults in their lives need to truly, really believe that it is possible for that child to grow. And they need to be in an environment where their mistakes are not held against them and where they can come back again and again in their most authentic form and feel loved and where they feel respected. And our third and final step was really to implement all the practices and skills that I'm sure everyone has seen in the middle millions of articles about trauma-informed care. Uh, trauma-informed care. And, you know, Claire trained all our staff on how to use skills that gave children freedom and were compassionate, like limit setting, esteem building, and some of the ones that I mentioned earlier. We painted our walls, calming colors, implemented calming rooms, bought many sensory toys. Um, we gave more free playtime because we know that that's our children's language and how they de-stress and process and process and express themselves. We brought in therapists and counselors to not just work with our students, but also with their families, as we know that children's families are an extension of them, not something separate from who they are. And we worked with the families to create growth plans for their children that made sense to them and include them in our process of learning about trauma-informed care and implementing in our program. Um, we did not bring them in to learn specific details about our students' experiences because to us it's never been about what specifically is happening to our child. It's more so about what we can do to just heal together as a community. We brought them in because we know that community heals and that one healing environment is not enough to transform students' lives. It has to be present in their homes as well and in their schools and in their churches and in every aspect of their lives. And we're not done. This work is not a checklist and it's, it's not something that you can be complete with. It is an everyday constant checking of our program and ourselves. But we believe in this work. We've seen the progress in our students. Um, we've, we, you know, we've heard fantastic results of them in schools, at home. And so we know that we can have a longstanding positive impact on our students and their families. And so we hope to continue this work. Thank you, Selma. And I just, you know, just one tie back, um, both of our presenters started with all young people have assets and potential to thrive inherently, uh, relationship, intentional relationships that are reparative and contexts and settings that are both emotionally and physically safe. So these are practices echoing the, the findings and what we know from the research. And Salma, you, you touched on something, you know, early in your story, which was such an interesting story on you know the challenges you faced as a practitioner when when learning how when learning your road to intentionality and the good advice from your dad and i love i loved hearing that advice and, and the transparency of your story and with that i'm gonna lob it over to ebony um, who i really look to when, in adult self-care because all of us need support in the work that we're doing um, we need support every day <laughs> really um, and ebony is going to share with us and she has some slides here to share um, the work she's doing. I'm going to do a little plug for Ebony while she's while she's doing this. This is, you know, a, a seven minute presentation of something that Ebony can take a day to do with adults. And so I encourage yes. all of you to, you know, get a get a sense of what Ebony um, is here to share, but also, you know, do if, if it's okay, Ebony, feel free to reach out to her because uh, this is her life's work and, and is really important as we endeavor to support relationship rich and identity safe contexts and settings. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much, Deborah. Absolutely. I can not spend a day talking about this and I, I forgive me because the slides will have a lot of information and I'll try to get through um, as quickly as possible within my allotted time. But it is a very important topic to me and one I get to um, implement every day and I'm very excited about. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you to Dan Gilbert and the After School Alliance and Dr. Deborah Roney and the American Institutes for Research for inviting me to participate in this important discussion today. I felt honored to be included with my fellow panelists who are awesome. I'm just so glad I'm able to participate in this conversation. And I'm happy to be able to share for the next few minutes um, on the importance of self-care and the social emotional health and well-being of youth development workers and childcare providers. My work with NJ SAC and uh, New Jersey statewide after school network as the chief operating officer allows me the opportunity to help in providing the direction and implementation of the work of the network and supporting providers, but also to include some of my background and experience as a family therapist in encouraging self-care um, for, for providers. So we have the uh, next slide up so far. So why self-care? Pictured here is an infographic that I've used in, in recent self-care workshops and presentations that I've done. I won't stay here long um, as it will be shared in my slides, but I like to share it because it provides a foundation for our thinking about where we are with regards to the pandemic and really in addition to all the, the systemic injustices that are also occurring. I like to ask um, participants without judgment in ourselves or others, where have we been throughout this pandemic? 
where would we like to be now and in the short term as we move towards a new normal or a different normal, whatever that looks like. So just taking a moment to looking, you know, at the different areas in the fear zone, the learning zone, and the growth zone as we continue to work through this every day. Next slide, please. So we as caregivers are wonderful and so supportive when thinking of the well-being of others and knowing exactly how to help everyone else. But we seem sometimes to lose our wisdom and expertise somehow when applying self-care principles to ourselves. Why do we think that is? Knowing what self-care is now even more important is, excuse me, knowing what self-care is now is even more important than before. It is not something that we force ourselves to do or something we don't enjoy doing. Self-care is something that refuels us rather than takes from us. It isn't a selfish act. It is not only about considering our needs. It's rather about knowing what we need to do in order to take care of ourselves and subsequently able to take care of others as well. That is, if I don't take care enough of myself, I won't be in a place to give to my loved ones, my colleagues, or those that I serve. So just a reminder for everyone that self-care looks different for everyone and has multiple benefits. It helps to improve your self-compassion, which we need every day. Balance and well-being. You will have more to give others, not less. Boost your immune system and it makes you more productive. Next slide, please. So here's the crux of a lot of my workshops and presentations that I do. What does holistic self-care look like? This is just a pictorial representation of, of what it could look like, um, and it could be different for everyone. All of the varying pieces of what makes us unique and special as human beings. The center, or self, is a representation of the perfect balance of each piece of us, maybe what we aspire to. How do each of these areas impact the other, and how do we combat imbalance when it occurs? How does our daily work impact each piece of us and how do these pieces, these pieces impact our daily work? So just a brief into introduction to the five dimensions of self-care. Physical self-care involving activities that improve your physical health, including nutrition, movement, adequate sleep, safety, health, and physical touch. I'm sorry, you can um, advance the slide so it goes all the way so you see all the different pieces. Oh, I'm sorry, go back to the uh, <laughs> there. I guess um, maybe they didn't come up. I'm sorry about that. Okay, so the first uh, piece of that is physical self-care, which involves activities that improve your physical health, including nutrition, movement, adequate sleep and safety, health, and physical touch. When you practice activities for your physical well-being, you can increase your energy levels and boost your self-esteem. Think about how you're taking care of your own body. Some examples, take, trying a new workout, taking a long bath or, or a hot shower, uh, laughing out loud, physical affection, good diet and exercise. The next dimension is emotional or mindful self-awareness. Emotional self-awareness is about being aware of your emotions and mindful of their impact on your behavior. Emotional intelligence or EQ is another way of describing our capacity to express our emotions and handle interpersonal relationships in a healthy manner helping us understand ourselves more, cope with challenges, and develop and nourish healthy relationships. Meditation and mindfulness are examples of self-care. Our next dimension is spiritual self-care, which involves practices that exercise your mind and soul, provide meaning, purpose, and value. Helps to establish peace and harmony in our lives and the ability to discover meaning and purpose being able to acknowledge challenges, engage in supportive self-talk, express feelings, and experience meaning in your career and your personal life is vital in your self-care and promotes self-compassion. The next one is personal or social self-care, which is described as the degree to which we relate to others, feel a sense of belonging and acceptance, how we surround ourselves with people and support with positive and supportive people, how we connect, communicate, and communicate. Particularly in these times of the pandemic and systemic and racial injustice, it's particularly important to stay close to those we feel loved and supported by and the closest to. And the last um, area, the, the, excuse me, the last dimension of self-care is professional self-care. When we think about positive professional self-care, this involves finding fulfillment in your profession and work and knowing that it has meaning for you. Whether or not what you do now to support yourself daily is a career or a short-term path headed to your long-term goals engaging in mentoring and coaching, participating in peer support trainings to better yourself, accessing and, and accessing and nurturing your creative side are all areas for professional self-care. 
And lastly, my suggestion is to take all of the five self-care areas and commit to yourself through an individualized self-care plan with things you can do daily, weekly, and so on. And remember to do things that you like or challenge you. My final question to everyone is, have any pieces of this circle changed as a result of the pandemic? And it's something to think about, not as a way to beat ourselves up, but also as a way, as a way to be aware of how the times of now are impacting us. Next slide, please. So how NJSAC has supported providers, I work for the Statewide After School Network. We've done um, bi-weekly after school conversations um, where we um, have um, providers call in, where we're able to share their experiences, questions, expertise, challenges, stresses, and really just be able to support one another. Uh, we've also invited mental health services um, providers to come in and do presentations, as well as we've had um, planning work groups um, that started over the summer and still going today in um, fall reopening um, health and safety guidelines for New Jersey, and then SEL mental health support, work, uh, support group that I hold myself for staff. Um, I also provide, excuse me, through the network, some um, workshops and presentations as requested, focusing on different aspects of holistic self-care. Um, that we provide to, to them as well. We also provide quality coaching and technical assistance through uh, technical assistance grants that we have. We have a COVID-19 webpage that we created um, to provide as much um, current up-to-date information regarding New Jersey and then self-care for the staff. One of the things we, uh, that's important to me is that to make sure that we also provide opportunities for self-care and support for the staff that we have at NJSAC. Can you think about um, what changes you wanna make? And here are some resources that I wanted to share. However, there's so many free works, resources out there for people to take advantage of. I know I went over a little bit, but that's my spiel for today. Thank you. That was great. Thank you so much, Ebony. And lots, I mean, for all of you, just lots of activity going on in the chat. I know you're not able to read it as you're speaking, but we will absolutely get these resources out to you. A lot of props and acknowledgement for the work that all of you are doing. And so, uh, we'll, we'll definitely record the chat and make sure our speakers see it. So I'm gonna, um, I know we're all from these development fields, so we're able to pivot easily. So I'm gonna pivot on my speakers a little um, and ask Sean to go first, if it's okay, in our, in our sort of casual discussion that we're gonna have. And Sean, if you wouldn't mind, can you expand a bit on healing-centered engagement and how it builds on and, or potentially departs sure. from uh, what we know about trauma-informed care? Yeah, and I just wanna just sort of start with, um, sort of opening around what Dan had mentioned that, you know, I think youth development in our after school programming um, right now is, is so important, important, largely because as a society right now, we're sitting in between trauma and transformation. And, and we're, we're, we, we, we know all of the trauma that we've experienced from COVID to the racial tensions, to the uncertainty, of our political environment to not being able to travel, the amount of uncertainty and trauma that we are experiencing right now makes the work that we do with young people and their families cr critically important. But at the same time that we are as a society sitting in between, uh, sitting next to trauma, we also have the potential for transformation. And that's where our work comes in. Um, <clears throat> the, the ability uh, to create the kind of loving, caring relationships that Salma had mentioned, uh, the ability to finally realize that the that the well-being of the adults, the self-care for adults, as Ebony has mentioned, is critically important in our ability to really show up in humane ways for young people. So um, that was a long sort of explanation, but what is that was just I wanted to get that out there because it's important for us to understand the moment we sit in. So when we talk about healing-centered engagement, it's really, um, it's three things really. Um, healing-centered engagement is, um, it's a process that aligns um, a perspective. So that's first thing is a perspective about how we see and understand young people and their families. Um, it's an approach, meaning that we have to have both the will and the skill to actually support, the, 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 uh, to support young people and their families with creating environments that are that are about restoration and healing and then thirdly it's a strategy and that strategy means that we have to take an inventory of our policies and our practices and values in an institution 
that oftentimes reproduces harm. Um, I, I love what, what Salma said that, that, that in their process, they actually begin to identify an inventory of those things that happen that actually are toxic to young people's well being. Um, but when I talk about it as a perspective, we also have to understand, we have to make some shifts in our own consciousness and understanding of what causes harm. And there's a way in which, when we talk about trauma-informed care, that sometimes we think about harm as um, um, occurring um, to individuals. Um, in, my, in my own teaching with graduate students, um, for example, we don't use the term um, PTSD post-traumatic stress disorder. The reason that we don't use that is because oftentimes the young people that we work with, there's nothing post about the stress that they experience. And to call it a disorder suggests that, the, that, the, that what's wrong or what's happened is actually inside of you. It is a disruptive behavioral pattern. And so we use the term persistent traumatic stress environment to more accurately describe the ongoing exposure to persistent stress, but also that it is not something that I need to fix in you, but I need to have an awareness of the policies and practices that are creating the harm in the first place. So those young people that are the um, uh, um, um, Mexican and Latinx immigrants that are, that are locked up in cages on the border, um, we need to deal with the, their separation anxiety, of course, but we also have to have a broader understanding that even if I do that, the policies and practices that exist in our society continue to harm communities. So that's an example of a shift in our perspective. That we, can't, that we have to, we have to sh widen the medical model perspective on what causes harm and begin to understand that harm is often experienced in a collective way. That is, you can go you can go to the Bronx, you can go to East LA, you can come here to East Oakland. You could talk to young people of color who are from low income and disenfranchised communities. They're gonna have a similar experience with trauma. So that means that we have to broaden our understanding of the things that cause harm and not, um, and shift from our perspective that harm happens only to individuals. Second sh shift in our, in our approach is that there's a way that I was trained as a youth development professional that, and as an educator that my role is to support and help young people. But I realized in my own work, years of work in youth development, that the quality of my ability to support a young person depends on the quality of the, the human quality of that adult. But as youth development professionals, we, we focus on the strategies, techniques, theories, concepts that we're supposed to provide to young people. But very rarely, as Ebony eloquently said, did we focus on the quality of our own human growth and development. That is, I can provide, um, I can provide profound, um, I can provide professional development to you, right? Um, but that doesn't necessarily make a better human being that can have a restorative relationship with a young person. But if I provide you with profound human development, guess what you get? You get a better professional but it doesn't work the other way around. So this, the approach then is also to be very intentional about focusing on the healing and the restoration of the adults who are in front of young people. And when we do that, uh, we begin to create the adults who can um, uh, show up in much more humane ways for young people so that they can begin to create healing-centered environments. And then lastly, as a strategy, and I think Selma has already articulated this, is is that we have to then look at the institution itself, the organization itself, and we have to identify two things. What are the values, policies, and practices in this institution that cause harm? The only way we know that is we actually engage and talk to young people, right? Sometimes as adults, we think we know it, but we talk to young people. And then, and then, and then the second list inventory is how can we shift those policies, practices, and values in ways that are restorative and focus on the well-being of young people. So in a, in, a, in a nutshell, that sort of perspective and approach and a strategy that provides an asset-based holistic understanding of, 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 of well-being. Um, we use these five principles, and I'll shut up after this. Um, we call them the karma principles. And those karma principles, we, karma stands for culture and identity. It's, I know it's just, I, let me just back up, culture. When you go to the workshop, you'll understand that culture is a, is a 
means culture, race, and identity. But for right now, because I don't have a PowerPoint, the first letter is C for culture. Agency, relationships, meaning, and aspirations. And it was so affirming to hear both Salma and Ebony talk about the, the confluence of these principles in their existing work. So karma, culture, agency, relationships, meaning, and aspirations are the principles that we use to shape a healing-centered environment. That is, you should be able to go into any school, any youth-serving organization, or any after-school program, and actually a, a measure and understand the relative presence of culture, agency, relationships, meaning, and aspirations within these, a classroom, within a school, or within an after-school program. So I'll stop there. That's, that's uh, our sort of quick um, summary of what Healing Center Engagement consists of. That's great. And you had like note takers in the audience comparing notes with each other. So that was great. No need for the PowerPoint. And I think the best thing I'm going to do right now is be quiet and see if our panelists want to respond to Sean. As it takes oh. me three minutes. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Salma. No, you can go ahead, Ebony. No, I was just gonna uh, gonna say, you know, it's so important. I love what what Sean said about um, uh, depends on the human quality of the adults and what we provide for them. The profound human development. It's going to be twice as hard to be able to provide this positive environment, youth development for youth if we're not in touch with the things that we need to be better humans. And so we should be constantly learning and growing, but we also have to be aware of the impact of what we do and what we experience daily on our youth so we don't provide additional trauma or 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 bias because we all have our own implicit biases that we have working with youth. So it's so important that we're able to do that. And I, I love that term. Ebony, I, 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 um, I was doing some work in a school district with teachers who were performing, um, teaching SEL, integrating SEL, doing training around SEL. And realized uh, one of the teachers came up to me after one of my training and they said, you know what? None of us get along. There's a team of five to seven teachers. None of us get along. And we, we argue and fight with each other all the time. There's racial slurs that they use, right? So there's all this stuff, right? And so I realized that even in, even in, our, even in our ability to teach social emotional learning, the adults themselves don't oftentimes have the practice or space or supports for their own social emotional growth. Um, and therefore is limited. How do I teach social emotional growth and learning if I don't actually practice it myself? How can I actually create a healing centered environment if I haven't dealt with my own trauma? So these things are critically important to really turn the mirror um, to the adult providers to ask questions about what are the systems of supports and how can I, we begin to re really focus on the growth of the adult as a important healing center and youth development strategy. Thank you, Sean. And we've, we've gotten some questions on this from the audience and I also um, want to prompt Salma on this issue, speaking of adults. <laughs> Is Salma, can you talk about your work in, um, in involving families and in the work that you do um, and in this work generally? And I, the audience members are really eager for practical advice if you have any as well. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, you know, I grew up going to Title I schools and I grew up being in all these different programs. And I remember my parents are from Mexico and, and they don't speak English. Um, and I remember my parents never, ever knowing what I was doing in school or outside of school. I remember them ne never having a clue. They would just pick me up whenever I would ask them. And I think that that happened so often to parents in marginalized communities where the organizations or nonprofits or schools that are working with students from these marginalized communities often consider themselves the experts on what children need or they'll go to other organizations or other people to gain insight on what the children might need. And this is also a trend that I've seen in conversations in trauma-informed care. And I really loved what Sean said about going back to the kids. And to me, it really is about going back to the kids and the families and learning from them and gaining insight from them what, what I need to know about their kids. I believe that parents are the experts in their children and what their children need. They always know more than we do. And um, I think when we, when, we, when we go the opposite way, when we don't inform parents on what we're doing, when we don't gain insight from them, we rob 
parents' autonomy and power away from them. And that stands against everything that we should all believe in. Um, and so something that I, I really started implementing and doing was everything that I was learning about trauma-informed care, about the way it impacted people and children and brains, I was also educating our families on. In our parent nights, in conversations with them, we were learning together and it was a process we were all involved in it. Um, I, I saw a question that was like, did I do home visits? I did all the things, <laughs> like we did home visits, we did bringing them in at our events, we had specific events catered to families to, to, to train and to talk about what's going on. Um, we had counselors that were brought in that had, you know, counseling sessions and whole group uh, meetings with parents. And we really started seeing that parents, you know, as we know, are an extension of their children. And they've also had really traumatic experiences that have impacted them. And as, you know, Sean and Ebony are saying, we're, we're standing here, we're talking about how we as practitioners need to take care of ourselves. The parents need to do the same. And it needs to be, it also needs to be reflected to them as well. And so I, I you know, but I also realized that when I would go to parents and we talk about these challenging behaviors that their kids were having, parents were really standoffish and didn't want to engage with me because we have to realize that a really huge goal of parents is to always make sure that their children are being protected and taken care of. And what we know is that um, that oftentimes parents aren't able to do that because of things outside of their control, like violence in their home country or persecution. And because of that, a lot of shame and guilt builds up in parents. And when we bring parents in to talk about how trauma affects their children, they can feel like it is their fault that this is happening to their kids. And these conversations oftentimes tapped into the shame and the guilt parents carried around. And this is exacerbated when we bring them in to talk about challenging behaviors. They'll get defensive and they'll feel as if they're somehow the cause of their child's behavior. And it took a lot of work at our bridge to find a way to work with parents in a way where they don't feel judged or get defensive and we had to reaffirm their autonomy over their children I had to tell them you are the expert of your child and what your child needs and no matter what no one could ever love or fully understand your child the way you do and we were able to after that really start partnering with parents to promote their child's healing we we're able to tap into the insight and wisdom that parents and community had and like Sean mentioned earlier collective trauma is a thing a lot of experience that some parents had other parents have had and have been able to work through through these things we were able to really you know hone in on that in our parent support groups they're able to talk to each other and build community within each other to learn from each other and we were able to learn from them as well throughout that process um, and you know doing that we were able to to work with parents and create growth plans for each child they really felt respected and loved by us our parent engagement rose to over 80 percent at our events which is really unheard of for the communities that we work with in the city that we work with. Sometimes their parent nights at schools are like five parents for the whole school. And so we really saw that parents were getting involved, community was getting involved, and we really promoted healing outside of our center. Thank you, Selma. We're, we're getting to the end of our discussion, which is wild how time, time flies. But I, can we do a lightning round with a question we didn't prepare for? I, putting you on the spot <laughs> like okay so um you know sean said earlier and it's true i mean we're at this moment between trauma and transformation and you know our fields our collective fields are getting a lot of uh, attention right now and the word trauma in fact is being used colloquially you hear it on the news you're hearing it more in schools than you did before how do we um not only respond to this moment, but prepare to be evergreen with our healing-centered engagement practices. You know, how do we think beyond where we are today? And I'm going to um, ask that we be uh, brief to that really hard question, and then we'll turn to some audience questions. And I'm going to start with Ebony. So I'm going to start with adult self-care. How can organizations really think about adult self-care now as they're doing so kind of acutely but really in the long term, as we recognize it's a key ingredient in our youth development programs. You know, I, I'm, I'm glad you asked that question, Deb, because I saw a comment in the chat and I think I probably just lost it, but it basically said, oh, here we go. And many youth workers are younger age themselves and have not done that kind of work for themselves. I think as program administrators, directors, statewide networks, wherever have you at a higher level, we need to make sure that we don't make the assumption that the people that we hire have the things that they need to work with the children we have. No matter whether there's some, some traumatic experience that we're assuming that they've been through or, or we know that they've been through, either way, we have to make sure that our staff is well prepared 
um, to be able to provide the support that they need. And they have the knowledge and the professional development and the training that they need. And then they have somewhere to go to for support for that. Um, one of the things that, you know, I self-care doesn't necessarily, wasn't an easy transition into working in after school and out of school time, but how can it not be because we're all caretakers? And as caretakers, we, you know, there's a term we've heard, I've heard, compassion fatigue. They go through things that because of that compassion that they have for the youth and the families that they serve, there's a fatigue that's going to come with that. And we need to be able to have a plan for how our staff are being supported and taken care of. So, and I'll just make it really quickly. One of the things that I also recommend is having a self-care plan, having, you know, addressing each of those areas and then making sure that there is time set aside for youth workers to be able to talk about and discuss the things that they're experiencing on a regular basis. Thank you, Ebony. Sean, let's go to you and then we'll go to Selma and I'm gonna be checking the chat box for questions. We're gonna to move to questions after that. Yeah, it could be just simple things like, you know, at your next st uh, staff meeting, allocate um, one minute per person to just check in on how they're feeling. Um, before you get into the agenda and before you get into all the kind of stuff that you have to deal with, just ask, how is there, how are you feeling today? Um, and go around the staff meeting, allow for one minute for people to do an emotional check-in. Things like that over time begin to create a culture and a, and a value of well-being. And, 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 it, and it also gives you, if you're leading that meeting, a sense of how people are doing. Um, sometimes you may want to create more time for people to, to, to check in. But simple practices that kind of disrupt the normal way that we work as very technical and tactical and strategic, we need to find ways to then shift some of that time uh, that are, that's much more relational and allows for us people to talk and, and express how they're feeling. Thank you, Sean. Selma? Realized I was muted, sorry. So Arbridge is actually in a very unique situation where 75% um, of our staff are immigrants refugees themselves. And so we found that a lot of our students' experiences were really re-triggering our, our staff and their experiences and was really harming them and impacting them. And um, so, you know, we had to really talk to our staff about trauma response in ourselves and what it really looks like um, to be triggered by our students' experiences and how that impacts us and our relationship with our students. And I think, you know, one thing that we really worked on is yes, we have self-care plans. We talk about mental health days, all of those things, but also having an environment at Arbridge where our staff have really close relationships and can rely on each other because we know that relationships heal and it, it, it does for adults too. And so something that, you you know, I'm really proud of at our work here at Arbridge is the relationships that our staff has created with each other and the way they're able to support each other's healing. And Deb, can I just add that in those, I'm sorry, in those moments when we ask our youth to do practice mindfulness, like as an example, or yoga, allow staff to do those same things. Don't ask them necessarily to walk around or, or fill out paperwork or whatever it may be. If you're struggling to find a minute or two, like Sean recommended in staff meetings, have them per participate in the mindfulness as well. Because that's a time and that's a great way to model for the youth what staff are, are preaching. Yeah, that's great. So I have a really great practical question um, and not everyone has to take it. So I'm just gonna ask the question, whoever feels like responding. So I'm gonna paraphrase here. Somebody asked the question, you know, we have required activities, we have homework help, we have things we you know, have to do. The reason the young people signed up or their parents signed them up. How do we balance those activities with the more relationship driven, relationship building activities that we've been talking about today? I can answer this one. This is really hard as someone who, who really focuses on healing and all of that. And I know you have to get through homework. A kid comes in, they have a bunch of homework. They also had a really bad day at school. And it's really, really tough to focus on healing and, you know, making sure they're okay when they have a bunch of homework they have to get through. And I think, you know, being, I, I've always been really close with the teachers of the students. And so talking to the teacher and, and, you know, just letting them know that today was a really hard day and the kid did as much as they could. I've, I've seen that teachers normally are very responsive to that um, and to, to that type of conversation. The second thing is, you know, really just sectioning time out. Um, I, we, we really place an emphasis on playing. 
um, for kids. And so even if they might not have enough time for us to sit down today and build relationship skills and do all of that, if they got to play today, if you told them one good thing today, if you tracked them for a minute and you said, you did a really good job on your homework today, I noticed how hard you were working. It's little things here and there that you are consistent with. It doesn't have to be every single day you dedicate 30 minutes to building relationships, to building communities. It's to me, it's about those little tiny practices um, with children that you that you go on throughout the days with them. Um, but I I know that struggle. It is it is very hard. It's real, right? And I saw yes. Sean, you also were tempted to respond. We could do like Jeopardy buttons next time. But now I'm going off of body language. <laughs> Did you want to add something, Sean, to that? No, you're all set. Okay, Ebony. You know, I think. It, it comes to also the culture that you create in the program. If you start at the beginning of the program saying that homework, yoga, mindfulness, uh, physical activity, nutrition is all important parts of your program and that's what they're going to be delivered at, at every part of the program, you're setting the stage for the expectations for the parents so they know what's coming. So, you know, it's not like you can't do it on the back end as well, but starting out with setting that expectation for what the culture is and what everything that's important. So that downtime is just important as homework time. That's great. Thank you. And we're going to do one last audience question here, and uh, then Deanna is going to take us to closing. So we have a question. Um, how do you go about learning if a child has a traumatic background without being invasive or intrusive, I suppose? Well, one of the things that I've learned that's really important is um, when the adult shares their story um, and not necessarily their story of trauma, but they share their story. Um, the question presumes that the kid has, ex the young person has experienced something and that the adult has to go get it and deal and do something with it. When, if, when the truth is, is that the adult has a story as well. Um, and when you share that story with a young person, it gives that per, it gives permission for the young person to do the same. And when you begin to share your stories, and I don't mean your, your professional credential stories, I mean who you are as a human being, things that happen. When you do that, you actually form these really, you form transformative relationships that, that then allow for that young person to, dis, to have the courage to share whatever they they want to share but but i think the practice of storytelling is is an is a really important tool uh to to um uh you know to uh, understand the stories that young people bring in our programs yeah and I want to I want to add on that, and I want to highlight what Haiti said in the chat. She said the good news is that these practices benefit all young people regardless of experience, and that is my belief. Um, I don't have to know what a child specifically experienced or what they're going through because these practices, this way of approaching education and working with children, works for all students regardless if they've had traumatic experiences or not. And I think so often uh, you were wired to want to know what's going on and, and know the intricacies of everything, and you know. When we find out something has happened with a kid, we want to bring the parents in and learn everything, but we don't need to know. And oftentimes when we do that, we actually are just re-traumatizing the child. And I think, um, I think it's in the book, The Boy Who Was Raised as a Dog. He has a chapter where he talks specifically about um, you know, how re-traumatizing it can be for kids when you have them replay the traumatic experience they've had. And when you talk about what, what's happened to them, that's oftentimes what happens is they just get re-traumatized and that doesn't promote healing. Um, and so I think, it, of course, we want to know every single detail, but it's okay if we don't, we don't have to. Yeah, I think uh, I had a program uh, I worked with in, in trying to, to bring best quality practices and they were worried about inclusion issues and not and not knowing the diagnoses of their children. And I said, be careful of that because if we know the diagnoses, we feel like we have to um, do a particular treatment plan or, or whatever it may be. And, and we have to be careful that we have the appropriate staff making sure to implement those treatment plans. And so the, the director said, you know, maybe I actually won't share them with the staff because they just need to learn how to work with that youth and the needs that they have. Um, back in the day, 20 years ago, when I used to work with youth on a regular basis, um, I often was given, I worked with high school students, the problem kids. 
And when I met them, I said, I, we're meeting each other today for the first time. We're going to get to know each other. I don't know anything about you. You don't know anything about me. Let's get to know each other. And because I approach them in a way that they're human, they're individual, and I'm not basing it on past experience or someone else's perception, it took some time, but I felt like they trusted me eventually. They had a good rapport with me and I worked with them based on what they presented to me, not anything else or any other knowledge. And so I feel like sometimes um, not even putting our staff in a position where they have to unhear something in order to have that. They need to just get to know that child, to get that youth and find out what they need, no matter what their behavior has been in the past, because past does not indicate what their behavior is gonna be in the present. You're getting like actual snaps and comments. Now. I see. Thanks, Salma. <laughs> <laughs> so clearly we, we, we could talk all, all day. Um, it has been my honor and privilege to, to be a part of this conversation. And I, all of you have, do a, just are doing amazing work in our field and are leading us and we're learning from you and you're learning from young people. So, so good, good for us in the long run. For those of you who didn't uh, have a chance to listen to the first webinar, I'm going to, I'm going to go into my old professor hat and give you an assignment. Go back and real and attach the stories you heard here to the research that was presented in that first um, in that first webinar because it was beautifully animated and, and illuminated here. So thank you, Ebony. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Salma, for the work that you do. Thank you for joining us. I am now going to in invite Dan back to the screen, who's going to talk to us about what's coming next. And wait, one more. Thank you. Thank you to everyone who's been so busy in the comment box, um, acknowledging the great things that our presenters were saying, adding your own great things, adding resources. We are going to get all this stuff together and get it back to you so it's all in one place. Um, and uh, I've learned a lot from all of you and this was just a, gr a great joy. Dan? Yeah, thank you so much, Deb, and, and uh, to all of our presenters. That was amazing. And I, I echo the, the sentiment that I could let this go on all day. I'd love to have just a podcast, just a weekly infusion of you, you three or four, including Deb. Um, that was just so insightful. And I hope I speak for, for all of our, our uh, attendees when I say thank you so much for coming and taking this time uh, to, to join us and share all these amazing, amazing insights. Um, so, uh, in just a couple of weeks, we'll be hosting the third webinar in the series. Um, so as you see on the screen here, it's gonna be on Thursday, October 29th at 2 p.m. Eastern. Uh, we do not have the registration page up, but we will shortly. Um, so just keep an eye out for that. We will make sure that everyone who registered for this webinar uh, knows about that and when it's coming. Um, and uh, we, we are um, gonna make sure that that's um, uh, uh, set up for you all. Um, and uh, just thank, you everyone in our audience, especially those of you who engaged in the chat box and things like that. Um, I, I really, when we were setting up this webinar, we were so excited that we had this slate of speakers. And even then I couldn't have imagined that it would be so, such a great organic conversation about how we in the field can really uh, meet the needs of the kids and take care of ourselves at the same time. So I, I think this was really critical. So thank you all so much for joining us um, and keep an eye out for, for the, follow-up email where we'll have the slide deck and the recording and a, a two-pager with highlights from this webinar uh, that we will be making in the next few days. Um, and then keep an eye out for the registration page for, or the registration link for the next webinar. So thank you so much, everyone. Thanks again to our presenters. That was uh, really, really amazing.